Yeah, we are. We are live now, Marcus. All right. Isabel, we're live on. Um, we're live on Facebook too now, Isabel. So, um, I'll explain what that uh, means later. Am I talking to? Am I talking to to Damien? Yep, that's me. Yeah. Marcus. How about I call Damon. you? I'll call you Hitty. And, oh, uh, good, yeah. And Marcus can call you and Isabel. And I'll call you Isabel. Yeah. Yes. Oh, that, then I'll differentiate and know yeah. who's who. Right. Oh, that'll work. Great idea. Okay. Great idea. All right, well, Isabel, we will resume or we will begin this interview in just a moment. Um, I will just hit record just to be doubly sure, Damo, yeah. although it actually doesn't want me to record today. So something's going on there. might need to update. Are you comfortable that Ecamm's... Uh, Doing a good job with the record? Yeah, yeah, it's definitely recording. And we've got 100 not out. Okay. My sound's okay? Sounds amazing. All right. Yeah, sounds good. All right, fantastic. Now, Isabel, when we finish the interview, yes. uh, don't hang up the phone because we'd like to have a little chat to you and say thank you again once we've um, once we finished our interview with you, okay? Okay, Marcus. Okay. Thank you, Isabel. All righty. <laughs> well, uh, well here done. we go. In three, two, and one. Welcome to 100 Not Out, a weekly show dedicated to helping you master the art of aging well. Marcus Pierce here with you, and boy, oh boy, I'm excited because we not only get to interview one of Australia's graceful ages, a centenarian today, we get to do so alongside Australia's number one wellness expert. He is Dr. Damien Christoph. Hello, legend. Hello, legend. I can't tell you, I'm actually a little bit emotional about it today. I am emotional about it. I'm excited. I, I've never been so excited. Uh, actually, I've been this excited probably two times in my life. One, three, three times in my life. One, when I was getting married to Amber. Two, when Jackson was being born. And three, when Richmond won the 2017 grand final. Um, have I been this excited? And, uh, and I feel blessed today. So I'm excited about today. Pissy. I think it's very special. We are celebrating Mother's Day, and when Damo and I thought about how do we celebrate or commemorate Mother's Day, and uh, you know, to share our thanks to the wonderful women of the world that have raised some incredible human beings and live wonderful lives, Damo had the great idea to interview his grandmother by marriage, Isabel. Damien, I'm going to hand it over to you to introduce your lovely uh, grandmother by marriage. <laughs> Thank you, Piercy. Uh, Piercy, the world knows how I felt about my grandfather um, and loved him to bits. And he, he lasted for th you know 15 days short of 100 years old. And I thought that he'd make that mark and he would he would be there. My favourite woman in the world, apart from my mum and Amber, uh, was my nana. And then her shoes were filled by a beautiful woman who I've only known for about 16 years. And, uh, and Isabel Wallace, who I affectionately call Hitty, is Amber's grandmother and the mother of Nick and Jill. And she is the most incredible woman you'll come across. She's sharp as a tack. She's absolutely beautiful. When I cuddle her, you feel like you're enveloping her because she's tiny. She's knee high to a grasshopper. Um, but she has the presence of a thousand men in a room. She's unbelievable she turns heads wherever she goes she's a crowd favorite i love her to bits and i love speaking with her and i want to welcome you to 100 not out isabel hitty it's wonderful to have you here with marcus and me today to share with our audience your life and uh and your lessons isabel thank you for joining us thank you damien and marcus I, I, those words are just a bit too much for me I'd, uh, i'll probably be a dead flop because of the wonderful <laughs> words that come first. <laughs> uh, Actually, I've agonised a little bit about today, so I hope I'll be all right. Well, okay. Isabel, you recently turned 100, an incredible milestone, uh, December yeah. last year. Does it feel, it's a bit like when someone asks you after you get married and, you know, how does it feel? Does it feel different having three you know, three numbers to 100 candles on the cake. What does it feel like to be 100? Well, actually, I've thought quite a bit about it since I turned 100, and, and I've had mixed feelings. Sometimes I feel it, it's absolutely wonderful, 
at the time I feel, well, what's the difference? I don't feel any different from what I felt when I was about 90 or <laughs> 99. <laughs> but but it's still, it's, I, I realise and it's an achievement which has been out of my hands. I've so nearly thought, well, I'll, I'll never make it. Beforehand, I was counting the days and I thought, I'll never make it. And I used to say to my daughter, Jill, Oh, no, I'll never make a hundred. And to my son, Nick, I'll never make it. And they'll say, well, you've only got a month to go. <laughs> or you've only got such and such a time to go. And and do you know what I really felt? Well, the minute I turned a hundred, if I did, that that would be the stone motherless end of me. I thought <laughs> I'd, I'd pass away when I turned a hundred. But funnily enough, I'm still here. And I don't feel any different from what I felt beforehand. So it's not such a milestone as people think. If they can get over some of the hurdles along the way, and there are plenty of hurdles, and they're blessed with great kids and great grandkids Mm -hmm. and great extended family, well, you live on. That is true, Hedy. We actually, um, we feared at one point that we were going to lose you uh, because you were very sick, and that's the reason why you moved from Coffs Harbour because... Uh, people won't know this, but um, you you were living in Coffs Harbour um, by yourself in Coffs Harbour as the president yes. of, the, of the Bridge Club, and you uh, yes. you fell ill. You had food poisoning. You hadn't eaten for a few yes. days. You fainted, yes. um, and you know you for for as you know I don't know you probably weigh on a good day about forty five kilograms. I think you dropped down to about thirty something kilograms uh, when you were. I crook. did. And, uh, and and fortunately, we were able to bring you to Melbourne, which was great. So bringing you to Melbourne meant that we were all able to spend more time with you. Uh, your grandchildren were able to spend time with you. Your great-grandchildren, you've been able to see all of them born and grow up. I mean, Jackson's your oldest great-grandchild, and he's 20, nearly 21. And then we go down to uh, Charlie Charlie and Tim's like youngest baby. And, and how old is she? Might be only a few months old now. And... And so you've seen this great span of great grandchildren come into your life, which I think has given you more life. Would you say that you feel probably more alive now than what you did when you first moved to Melbourne? Uh, I was quite prepared to be dead when I first moved to Melbourne. Mm-hmm. And then I began to be introduced to my family again. And it's just made all the difference in the world to me. I've, I love my family. I love them. I, there, was, there are just not enough words to describe how much they've meant to me and how they've kept me alive. First, my two kids, Jill and Nick, and they've been, well, they're completely different kids. You know, one is so different from the other, but they're both pres- very precious and they are wonderful. And then the extended families, their marriages, and the people they've brought into the family, and one by one I've met them and loved them, and they've all helped me with getting along with life. I just don't think I'd be alive without them. Mm. Isabel, it's a... a, uh, Sorry, go on. Marcus, go on. Oh, thanks, Isabel. Um, You mentioned, you just said that you don't think that you could go on without them there is uh in all of our research an incredible amount of purpose that family provides now yesterday as the day that when this uh, episode or interview is released yesterday in australia was mother's day what can you describe for people i I mean i think uh as a father i look at my wife sarah uh who was a chiropractor by profession and decided to become a a a stay-at-home uh, mum, uh, she felt just called to to be a mum, and I look at her with just awe and wonder. Um, I I don't know how how Sarah and, and millions of mothers do it. I have just great respect. Can you describe for us the feeling um, of what it's like to be a mum? Um, what how do, you say it gives you purpose? Can you just can you put that into words um, if you can? Well, I can tell you that my kids are eight years apart, which is a big span in life. And Jill was the firstborn. And I can remember when she was born, I can remember, first of all, the labour, which was 
anything but delicious. But however, when she was born and I looked at her, I thought, it's been all worth it. She looks so beautiful, red head and all. She just looked a luscious, luscious, luscious thing, and I thought, oh, I'm never going to be like, I'm never going to be on my own again. I've got her, and right from the start, I knew I had somebody to back me up. And to be a mum, well, I was a bit worried about being a mum. I will admit that whether I'd be successful or not, because I think everything that you do in life, when it's different, and this was completely different from being free being tied up as a mum for the rest of your life, not just for that instant when they're born, but you knew it was going to go on and on and on. And then eight years later, then she grew up and she was eight years old and then Nick was born. And where she was a flaming redhead, I had the first, my first look at this newborn was a little dark-eyed, dark-haired boy. And I thought, wow. How will I ever cope with him? How will I be a mum to him? <laughs> but it's kind of automatic, you know? You just love, you love your kids with a passion and nothing can take that away from you. And, and well, I suppose you devote everything to your kids because they mean so much to you. And without them, you just wouldn't be here because they keep you propped up. As I say, both differently, but... but both beautifully, um, beautifully sing, simple, sing, singular in that they they both act differently to you, and but they both do things for you, yeah. make your life worthwhile. Yeah, well, I think. Yeah. Uh, Hedy, it's uh, it's wonderful to hear you speak like that about both Nick and Jill, and uh, and I know them both very well. And I, and I can hear what you're saying there, and, and I love that. And one of, my question was going to be, what gets you out of bed each day? And, and do you feel like you've got purpose? But when I hear you talk about Nick and Jill, and I, can, I can hear that there's purpose there. But you don't get to see yeah. Nick and Jill every day. You don't get to see your grandchildren every day. And you don't get to see your great-grandchildren every day. So what, what is it that gets you out of bed every single day now? What, what do you feel like your purpose is these days, Hitty? Because... Well... Uh, we... Mainly they mean is to get up for for, for breakfast. That's the main purpose at 6.30 in the morning. <laughs> to, to get up and see if the porridge is delicious or whether it's lumpy or not. At 6.30 every morning, that's in my brain. But the purpose to get out of bed is is just not to stagnate in the bed. Yes. You know, uh, uh, you could easily, when you get old, when you get to be 100... You could easily give up and think, oh, well, you know, I don't need to get up today. I'm very tired. I'll sleep in. But if you were to give up like that, well, I think you'd be sleeping in for a lot longer than a few hours. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. In fact, you may not um, ever get up if you just kept on, if you gave up the ghost. Um, Hitty, do, <laughs> do you think that uh, given that Melbourne's having a bumper year this year um, and you're... Is it six and zero or seven, seven and seven. zero? Seven and zero. Six zero, I think. Yeah. Well, it depends on what happens this weekend, I suppose, and when this goes out. So it, it'll be interesting. But uh, Hitty, do you think that's giving you purpose? Do you want to see them win a grand final before you you pull up stumps? Well, you know, I have seen them win a grand final. Well, another one, that. another one. You know, you know what I'm. Mean. Yeah, another one. Hitty. Would be nice. <laughs> There's not many would, people left on the but, planet who have actually seen Melbourne win a grand final, but, but you have. No. But, it would, it would be nice, but uh, it, it's funny how you're unconvinced. You know, I think they're going so well. Next week, it, it won't be so good. You, you're always a doubting Thomas. You can't <laughs> ever accept the fact that <laughs> that they appear to be so good. I think but I a, think... Uh, yeah, sorry, go on, Isabel. No, it's uh, okay. Uh, I'm uh, finished. I, I was just going to I... say before you go on there, PC, because one of Isabel's great skills, hit his great skills, is the footy tipping. And I actually don't recall a year that you either haven't come first or second in the year of footy tipping. And, and I suspect this year, Hitty, you're also leading the footy tipping. Would that be true? That's true, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. there I, you go. I'm now sitting, I think, after this very 
bad weekend was a very hard, and I didn't do well. I think I'm now second. <laughs> Plenty of time for you to make a comeback. Now, Damien did mention, Isabel, that you are one of the few remaining human beings that were alive when Melbourne won a premiership back in 1964. But if I can take you back perhaps another 20 years before then as the Second World War was coming to a close, many of us uh, living in Australia have now, these days, I was born in 1981, we haven't experienced times like we have in the last 12 or 18 months, but my fascination with people that have lived through wars um, would normally tell me that what we've lived through in the last 12 or 18 months is nothing compared to what it is to live through war times. Can you take us back to those times when you were in your mid-20s and Australia was a very different country back then and, and, and what those experiences do for you in times like these COVID times? I can. I can take you back to that time because at that stage when war broke out, Second World War broke out, I was just leaving teachers' college and I had my first school to go to and you wouldn't believe it, but I chose Malakuta. <laughs> I think I chose it on its name because it appealed to me, but I couldn't believe <laughs> when I was actually going to Malakuta to take up the post that I, I thought to myself, I will never get there because you didn't just fly or you didn't just get in a train or a bus. You had to do things like go to Bairnsdale by train then get out of the train and go to Can River and stay overnight in Can River and and then go on the next day by bus to Malakuta. And then to find that I was going to literally just a little... Uh, it was kind of a very, very, very small school and now it's a booming high school, but this was a very, very tiny school, one teacher school. And I think I had about 14 pupils and two boys who used to row across from Gabo Island each day if the weather was good. And so I was in a very small environment and it was a fishing village then. Now it's livened up and it, you know how often Malakuta is, is mentioned now. Yeah. People are really keen on the place. And I just fell in love with the kids there. They were beautiful and they taught me and I realised how dumb I was they taught me compass points. They taught me about wildflowers and the names of wildflowers. And they taught me everything. But we did, you know, we, it was a beautiful experience, that, because, as I say, I loved the kids. And we built an air, air raid shelter out the back of our school, out, out the back of the school. And the kids came along with their, with their hose and their picks and their shovels and they made this very, very deep slit in the earth. And even the little kids came along with their buckets and spades. And everybody worked hard to build this air raid shelter with the result that the first time it rained, the air raid shelter got full of water and became a, a, a definite danger point for the kids because quite easily any of the kids could have drowned. Then I had to get the air, There was an Air Force contingent there so I had to get the Air Force in to empty the the, the ditch that they'd built and and, and it, it we had wonderful experiences there it was it was like as if I'd lived there for a lifetime and now when I hear Malakuta being mentioned so much well think of the dreadful bushfires last year mm. but when I hear it I think of myself there in love with the kids in love with the place in love with some of the airmen and the army. There was a, <laughs> an army contingent there as well. So it, it was a great place for a young woman to to really grow up. That's where I grew up. But different life from what it is now. Yes, we were petrified about the war and we had to be very careful of, of closing all squeaks of light and not allowing ourselves to be vulnerable to... It was the Japanese who were fighting then and, and we had to be very careful because they sent aeroplanes over spying on us all the time. Mm. So we had to watch that. But now we've got different concerns. We've got the COVID concern now, mm. which because I'm 100, 
I don't feel inside as much as I felt inside when the war was on. Because every day during wartime, every newspaper had the list of the killed in action or wounded in action. And you couldn't go a day without seeing somebody you knew in the newspaper. It was either killed in action or wounded in action. Well, now you've got this terrible um, COVID thing where people just die. Mm. Look at India, where they're dying in thousands or millions. Mm. So it, it seems to me as if you're plagued nearly all your life, plagued by either war or well, I don't know which is better, really. Neither is any good. No. Either, either one is pretty foul. Hmm. But it's a different life. It is. It is definitely a different life. And, you know, if, you can't, if we kept on the reminiscing, um, you know, talking about your time in Malakuta, is that where you met Ernie? Had you snuck out one night um, from teachers, <laughs> from your teaching somewhere and snuck out and bumped into Ernie somewhere in a dark alley? Is that what happened there, Hitty? Damon, I would never have snuck out. You know, I told you in the beginning I was pure. I know better than that. I never would have snuck out. Never would have snuck out. But you wouldn't believe I was only at Malakuta, I think, for two days before Ernie came down with a, uh, not a squadron, like I've forgotten what they call them, a platoon of infantry men. Yes. And it was the beginning of the war. And I didn't sneak out to see him, but... He got as far as Orbost in, uh, I suppose it was a train or a... No, he came in an army truck. And the lieutenant who was there before, he was a lieutenant, and the lieutenant who was there before him said, I can remember so well, he, he was wondering who, who was going to replace him. And he said, I hope it isn't Wallace. <laughs> and I, I said to him, why do you hope it isn't Wallace? And he said, because I think you'd fall for Wallace. <laughs> and I said, well, <laughs> and you don't did. be ridiculous. Well, I went, he said, we'll go, I'll take you up to Orbos, which was, we did things that you never, you would be now jailed for doing or you'd be locked up. Oh, tell and us what said, they were. We want to know. <laughs> and he said, if you hide in the army truck or the army tender, whatever it was called, well, I'll be able to take you up to Orbos to meet whoever it is. <laughs> so I had to get right down in the truck, in the front of the truck near the driver, and hide whilst we got into Orbost. And then in came this army truck, and he said, Ah, oh, damn, Wallace, it's Wallace. <laughs> And I thought, hooray, <laughs> it's Wallace. <laughs> Wallace, I can't wait to see this Wallace. And so... This Wallace ca then came up to our truck and introduced himself. Well, at, at, at my driver knew him, my left and knew him, but he came and, and made himself known to, and was introduced to me. And I thought, oh, what a hunk. He was really beautiful. He had his, he had his army shorts on and he was brown all over and, and he was young and vibrant. And I thought, oh, boy, no wonder. No wonder this Theo had said to me, I think you'd fall for him. And I thought, I've already fallen for him and I've only said two words for him. <laughs> well, the next day, we got home to Malakuta and I went to where I was boarding and they went out to the Air Force, to the airstrip. And the next day, he came into the school and I can remember looking out the window and, of course, the kids knew everything up there. They didn't... You know, they, they they could see my interest in him, and they were all for pushing me on. And I could, I could see him coming up to the school, and I thought, beautiful. So, I went to the school door, and there he was, and he was all so chatty and so friendly. So that, and I fell for him, of course. And and I don't think he, he was prepared to fall for anybody. I think he was just, you know, he was just going to be friendly. But, gee whiz, once I got my clutches into him, he didn't get away. <laughs> but, but we had a lot of interesting things. Another time when we were there, we decided we'd, a couple of the girls, there were only about oh, six girls in Malakota and all these men, and we decided, I bought it at the, at the pub then, and we decided we'd go out to the airstrip 
which was a sinful thing to do because particularly we were girls and, and young girls and we weren't very high. And they, when we got there, they thought we were Japs. But we had to bribe some of my husband, Ernie's men, to lend us some of our, their uniforms. So we had these great uniforms which were mile too big for us even though they were only little and we staggered out one of the girls could drive uh, her father's truck and we went off over the Betka River there was a river dividing us with the airstrip and because you weren't allowed to go anywhere near the airstrip because it was territory that was dangerous and, and only fit for the enemy and we had to try and get over the bridge and we had to bribe. We took, because it was from the pub, we took beer and, and cigarettes. And we pretended we were smokers. We had these butts all over the floor. And so we bribed the men who were guarding the Bedka River with bayonets, I might add, with <laughs> bayonets. And we bribed them and said, look, we're only pretending. We're just going out to see the boys. And, and so... We got through, and they they could have been court-martialed for letting us through, of course. And when we got there, there was a ter- terrific siren, and the whole of the airstrip was was alerted that the, the foreigners were, had invaded. And so they came at us with bayonets to get us, because they thought <laughs> we were little Japs. <laughs> and one of them... And one of them fell down the ditch and broke his leg. And that meant that my poor Ernie, who was in charge, had to admit to, I think they were heads were at Bairnsdale then, had to admit that that his men had let us through. And that's what caused it. And he was almost court-martialed. But see, we didn't, even though it was tough times, we were still able to do wicked things. I love how much... Life. I love how much risk you took to fall in love, Isabel. I just love the story of your love story. And I would, you told Damien and I before we did the interview that um, your husband Ernie died, I think Damien was saying it was 1999, so a bit over 20 years ago. You were married for more than 50 years and you said before we started the interview that you would love to be able to talk to him, that you said there was something very special about being able to talk to people that you really, really love. Can you, can you share with us, you know, the role that love has played for you in your life and particularly that intimate love um, of a soulmate? Because uh, the reality is, Isabel, that more and more people uh, today in, in the Western world live alone and, and decide not to partner up and, and, you know, take the risk to fall in love, which is what you, you definitely did. Can you share with us the payoff of, um, of playing full out in order to fall in love and connect with someone like Ernie for over 50 years? Well, Marcus, it's not all beer and Skittles. You do have your ups and downs. <laughs> I think marriage. anybody who tells you marriage is easy, well, I always look at them and think, well, you know, you should have a psycho analysing you because I don't think marriage is easy. I think it's darned hard. You have to work hard on it. And I think we did. We did. But it, when you have your husband or husband has his wife, you don't realise what a precious commodity it is till after they've gone. And so often when I come to bed at night, I think, oh, I'd love to be able to tell Ernie this. I'd love... And then I think, just like to be able to talk to him. Mm. You know, it's lonely. It's a lonely life when you've had love and when you've had... Uh, when you've had kids together and you've got your kids to talk about. I think you want to tell them what the, the grandkids or what the kids have been doing. Mm. And, and you know how proud they'd be. And, and it's, it's very hard to know you can't tell them. Mm. Because my grandkids have been stars too. Absolutely. And not have been our stars. And I would just love to be able to tell my husband things like that. 
But see, you can't do it anymore. Mm. It, life's tough when you're 100 mm. and all your loved ones have gone. It's, um... I think of my time in Coffs Harbour and I think, well, probably there wouldn't be anybody left up there. It's or possibly, be able yeah. to play my bridge. Yeah. Mm. I, uh, so, Amber and I, Amber and I were walking through the um, through the national park the other day, and we were reflecting on um, when people pass away. You know, whether it be Tony, whether it be Ernie, whether it be you know Rock, my grandfather, or even my grandmother. Yeah. Um, you know, what what are they thinking when they're up there? You know, are they having a discussion? Are they you know looking down at us, going, well, you know. You got to stick around. Hopefully, you did something good with your life. And um, and what are they thinking about when they're up there? So we were thinking about that just the other day. And um, you know, I, it, it just what you were just talking about there, Hitty, makes me wonder. Um, you know what? What what are the conversations that they're having? If they're having anything, I know that they'd probably want to be telling us and sharing wisdom with us as well. I'm sure of it. Hitty, what are your views on aging and? Um, and what are your views on older people? Obviously, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think in Australia we do it really well. Um, I think we're blessed that we've got a facility where you're able to stay and, and feel safe and secure. But what, what, how do you feel about aging and, and older people these days? Uh, well, Damien, I don't. Is it Damien or Marcus? Yeah, it was me, I don't Damien. Know, yeah. Well, I don't know how. I don't know how normal age, aged people feel. I only know that I've been very, very fortunate to have... And, and I would never have said the, this to you early because I always thought that old people, poor individuals, they had to go into a nursing home. Mm -hmm. Well, now, my views on a nursing home have changed dramatically because this is a absolutely perfect nursing home in the fact that we've got wonderful staff here, the girls, the carers, the nurses, they were all so kind and wonderful. The management, they kept COVID out of, out of this place. They locked us down. They, they did everything to keep it out and they kept it out. And to age and be, uh, be lucky enough to have found somewhere to live I can remember remember when I came down from Coffs Harbour and the kids said, you can't live up here, you're in hospital, you're too sick and you can't live on your own, you've got to come to Melbourne. And I can remember saying, well, and I'd made this into, this was in my mind so often beforehand that I would never live with my kids because I thought they were young, they had lives to lead, they didn't need to be tied down with an old person in their house. So I said to them, I'll come to Melbourne then if you find me somewhere to live. Well, it was a kind of lottery, although they wouldn't say it was a lottery because it went round to a lot of places and they found this place and I've been blessed because it is beautiful. The management, absolutely 100% behind the management I am. They, not any of them could be better, I don't think. I haven't had any nastiness. I haven't had any body have any gripe with me it, it's been it's been wonderful and I've been very lucky aging I would say if people could find somewhere nice to live I don't advocate living with your kids because I don't think that's good for either side that's just my personal opinion a lot of people think differently now Is it I, I think I'm lucky I think you've lived an incredible life, Isabel. You touch on the community of people that you live with, that you have connected incredibly well with them. And uh, you did help us interview Melbourne Premiership player, Noel McMahon, a bit over five years ago, who is a um, a, a neighbour of yours uh, where you live. What, what about when you reflect on your life? What role has friendship and and community and social circles played on your life? Have you Have you lived an active social life over the years? Uh, yes, I did. I did. Now, I was in Coffs Harbour for what, over 20 years and before that Bendigo and I was very social 
in the fact that I played bridge and in Coffs Harbour I played up to four days a week and I was competitive. It's no use playing bridge if you're not competitive. If You have to be competitive. I can remember you, you fall out with your partners. It's never your fault when there's trouble. It's always your partner's fault. And I can remember falling out with my partner and... I was alerted by her because her husband said to her, what did she, the she being me, call you today? That's names. And so I remember being so savage with her for something she did that I said, you're a dickhead. You're a dickhead. With that, she threw the cards on the table and it was a competition. You can't throw your cards on the table, but she did. And she said, and I'm never playing with you again. So she marched out and we never played together again. But see, that, that's just one instant. Mainly, everybody, mainly after bridge finishes, people become friendly again. And, and it, we would always go out to lunch after bridge socially and enjoy it thoroughly, although that's where I got food poisoning at one of the restaurants. But... That was the uh, partner of yours. She yeah, actually yeah. put that food, uh, she poisoned that food. Yeah, she did something to that dim sim, I Yeah, reckon. totally. She must have fancy, fancy calling anybody a dickhead. <laughs> especially, a nice, especially a nice woman. And she was a nice woman and didn't deserve that. But she didn't, we never really spoke together again. But Bridge, I, I, social, yeah, I had wonderful social time. Besides, oh, earlier on, of course, I played sport, but I only played bridge in Coffs Harbour. But always lunch, there was always lunch afterwards. Every birthday for everybody we knew, we'd go out on the town for birthdays. But you can do, you know, I always had a good social life, even early on when I was married to Ernie. And I can tell you one funny story. When I think of my life and I think of the socialising, the one thing that was vitally important to me was to get an invitation to the mayoral ball. Everybody in town wanted an invitation to the mayoral ball, and of course I wasn't any different from anybody else. And I really, really wanted that. And finally, although I don't think it could have been finally because it was very early in my married life, but we got this invitation, and I can remember getting a new dress. Talk about socialising. It was off the shoulders, and it was str- it was backless, and oh, did I think I was just Christmas? <laughs> and so I was about to socialise at the Merrill Ball, and we had a party at our house beforehand, and I didn't know about the evil potential of gin at that stage, <laughs> and somebody at the party said, "Give her a gin." And I had a gin and I didn't really at this stage even taste it. And I thought it was tasteless stuff. So I got really onto the gin. And and I I think Ernie might have been on the gin too. I'm not sure about that. (laughs) But we got to the mayoral ball. And I can remember the first dance was a foxtrot. And oh, smart me, smarty in my regalia. So round we went. And when we got dead in front of the mayor and the mayoress, I fell flat on the floor and dragged Ernie down too. So the <laughs> pair of us are flat on the floor. This is our socialising when I was young. <laughs> well, it took a lot of hard work to get another invitation, I can assure you. <laughs> but we did plenty of socialising, but can you imagine? That, that's a blemish on my life. When I think of the bad things I've done in life, that's one of the bad things. <laughs> Falling in front of the mayor and mayoress. Oh, that that's a disgrace. <laughs> but, yeah, plenty of, <laughs> plenty of socialising. We we actually were very social. We had a lot of parties, went out a lot, always keen on sport, played golf, played tennis, played real and then lawn bowls. No socialise and, and so you can socialise until you're very old. But then comes a point in the really old age, I'm talking in the 100 era and up to 80s, 
I think I was young at 80, but from there on I began to get too old to socialise. But I've done plenty of that, and, and most of most people do do plenty of socialising. And I can remember, that, remember Damien meeting Pa, mm. your Pa, and I love Pa, and we used to go out and have lunch, didn't we? Yeah. At that lovely place near the Yarra. Yeah. And I, I just loved those days. Yeah. I've, I've done plenty of socialising yeah. and enjoyed it thoroughly. Yeah. One of so, our great joys, Amber's of my great joys, is to go and pick up Isabel from the nursing home and take her out for lunch. And, you know, we often think it'll take us a couple of hours, but it's the better part of half a day. And we, uh, and we absolutely <laughs> love it. It's, uh, it's one of the greatest yeah. things we do um, in our, in our month is to go and see you, Hitty. We absolutely love it. I've learned a few things today from you, Hitty, um, that are very similar to Amber actually. And, uh, and, and, I, and I'm, I'm, ca- I'm cautious to s- how I'm going to say this. Uh, one is that Amber also has a love of gin. Um, she can't drink as well as what you can, I, I think. <laughs> Hitty, uh, definitely. Uh, I, de- I now know, understand why Amber fell so heavily in love with me when she first saw me, uh, because that must be genetic uh-huh. as well. I think that's what's happened there, Hitty. Uh-huh. <laughs> I think that's what happened. Probably. Um, Probably. And- and I suspect, even though Amber plays the good girl card, I think she was probably as naughty as what you were when she was as young as what you were when you were really naughty. I'm yet to see that yet, but I'm sure that I will. I'm sure that I will. But I've I've absolutely loved listening to your stories today, Hitty. Um, I love you to bits, and I know that everybody who's listened to you today uh, will love you to bits as well. But I, I can tell you this, Hitty, you've made a mark on tens of thousands of people's lives everybody that you've come into contact with throughout your whole lifetime and everybody who's blessed enough to celebrate with you on a daily basis or a weekly basis or a monthly basis just to hang out with you um you, you've made a, a life lasting mark on their life which is of greatness and i just want to thank you and i'm, I'm grateful that you came into my life so thank you Hitty. Oh, you make tears come to my eyes. And thank you for taking the time and for listening to me. Hmm. Oh, we could do it for hours, Isabel. It's been an absolute joy. And a lot of our listeners who have joined us on our Facebook Live are saying things like, I just want to hug her. She sounds so cute. And Trudy (laughs) Pettis says, Amber, I love her. Uh, so as Damien says, you are bringing joy to a lot of people and, uh, we are so grateful for your contribution and for sharing your stories. And we love the wicked stories. They're the best ones. Um, (laughs) Isabel Wallace at 100, there are, there'd be plenty more, but we'd like to wish you, and I know you might say that your best years have been the years preceding, but we like to wish every guest on this podcast, may the rest of your life, Isabel Wallace, be the best of your life and thank you so much for joining us on 100 Not Out today. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you, Damien. Thank you, Hedy. Thank you, Damo, for organising this interview with uh, your grandmother. And to all of the mums out there, uh, we thank you for your contribution to humanity. Uh, Mother's Day, it is, again, some of us think it's a marketing day, and for many people it is, but it's just a timely reminder to thank our mums and our grandparents uh, for the wonderful contribution they make to our lives. For more on the great man that is Damien Christoph, head on over to damienchristoph.com, myself, marcuspierce.com.au to all of our loyal listeners and viewers thank you for your support of our message and until next time continue to make the rest of your life the best of your life bye for now thanks facebook thank Thank you very much facebook yes thank thank you very much uh great to have everyone there thank you so much for um for everybody's commentary and joining in and uh it's just it's it's just unreal Amber's been listening to this and watching this, Hitty. Uh, she's she's been watching it, listening to it live, which has been fantastic. And um, she makes a great point Is here. She horrified. No, she's just absolutely <laughs> wrapped. She said, "Thanks, team. That was so awesome." Uh, but the other thing is too. Um, Amber says, and, I, and this couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, this this is so true. This is so not further than the truth, but this is so this is so true. Mothers come in all different shapes and sizes, and and um, and um, you know Amber is 
is such an unbelievable mother to Jackson, and it's a great reminder um, yeah. of of yeah. how how different motherhood could be um, for everybody. So thanks, thanks, Jimmy Just, Jam. And, she loves him. Yeah, she, she loves, loves him. him. Just she on that demo, yeah, like on that somebody. is. I was going to ask you this during the interview, Isabel. Um, yeah. When my dad met my nana, so his his mother-in-law, um, yeah. after either early on or after some time, he he just started calling her mum. And I don't know if that was a generational thing. I don't know if that happened a lot just back in the early days. But I think what Amber said is so spot on. Like a mum does not have to be the genetic. Um, mother of of a child there are so many um times in our lives yeah. and if we just extend this to to men as well where the non-biological parent um plays the role of of a mum or a dad and that could be a neighbor next door playing a parental role or an in-law or a step or a twice removed or the rest of it did you find that with your um with your in-laws like your son-in-law or your daughter-in-law and and then other people in your life that that you still felt uh, motherly to them particularly during tough times oh yes yes you do you do because they're they're they're, they're the closest things you've got to you you know your your husband's or your wife's parents and and their relations they're close to you Mm. automatically close to you and and so many times you really love them if if for, uh, I love my daughters in law I love my daughter in law I can't help it because when I look at her I automatically love her and I've loved her ever since I've known her mm. and now mm. yeah this is the way it goes I think you fall in love and they they help you with life I think Mm. Um, in fact, I don't think I know they help you get along with life mm. and they give you sane support, which is what you need because you go off the rails pretty quickly. <laughs> 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 That's yeah. so true. Uh, yeah. Well said. So well incredible. Said. You yes. are incredible, yeah. Hitty. All right, mm. well, we'll let you go. It's probably afternoon tea time now. I'd say okay. at 3.30. Okay, Damien, thank you. Thank you, Thank Hitty. you, Marcus. Thank you, Isabel. Bye thank bye. you so much. That was a joy. <laughs> Bye-bye. See you. Bye-bye.